Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kafirun Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun Say, O kafirun, O disbelievers, O non-Muslims La a'abudu ma ta'abudun I do not worship what you do what you worship Wa la antum a'abiduna ma a'abud And you do not worship what I worship Again, repeating again. And I'm, I, I don't worship what you worship. And you don't worship what I worship. I mean, absolutely crystal clear. Make it absolutely clear. You and I are not on the same deen. This is what this surah is saying to the kuffar. It's not as some people they say, they, quote, they look to the last ayah, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ To you, your deen, and my, to me, my deen. And they read this and they think, this is a surah about, you know, of... Multiculturalism of you know tolerating and respecting other gods, other idols, either you know all the people's false, all the people's false religions to recognize them. To rec that's not what this ayah is talking about at all. The ayah is saying clearly that there are two camps: the camp of Islam and the camp of kufr, and those two camps are not the same. They are not unit, united or unified. They do not share a religion, a brotherhood, an ummah. They do not share anything. They are distinct groups. They are completely separate. Each one recognizes that the other is not from the same deen. Not from the same millah, from the same ummah, from the same nation, from the same religion. They don't follow the same way of life. They don't worship the same ilah. That's what the surah is saying. It's saying, O oh, kafir, O oh, disbelievers, you and I are different from each other. You are not part of my ummah and I am not part of your ummah. Meaning, if I am the Muslim, if I am a Muslim, you are not a Muslim. And if you are in your religion, I am kafir in your religion. I disbelieve in your religion, just as you are kafir in my religion. You disbelieve in my religion. That's what the surah is saying. So Allah ordered us to have this bara'a from the shirk and its people. To have this disassociation from the, the polytheism, the association of partners with Allah. And anybody who does that, not just, okay, you worship you know, uh, Krishna, but you know, you're okay, we're brothers. We are from the same ummah, we're all one nation, we're all you know, British, so therefore we are a brotherhood. And you have your God and I have my God. No. You know, not that, oh, I, I am free from your religion. I'm free from your shirk. I'm free from your worship of other than Allah. I'm free from your idols. But I'm not free from you. But we're brothers. No. Ya ayyuhal kafirun is the people as well. al baraatu min al-shirki wa ahli To have this association from the shirk and its people. From the disbelievers and their kufr. So this is what this surah is all about. So that is why there is an essential duty to make takfir, to declare as disbelievers, and I'm using the word here as a broader sense, not in the sense of necessarily uh, just calling somebody who used to be Muslim an apostate. No, I mean in general, to call the kafir a kafir. The one who does not Make takfir, do not call kafir those who disbelieve in Islam, they have not fulfilled the conditions of Islam itself. Islam is defined. What's the definition of Islam? I don't have whichever any of you brothers want to volunteer, inshallah. What's the definition of Islam? It's the Islam. It's the Islam. Carry on. Anybody? Istislamu lillahi tawheedan Okay, so this is, let's get this part in. Total submission to Allah with exclusivity. Then, وَانْقِيَادُ لَهُ طَاعَةً
and two, follow or submit to him with obedience. And the last bit is what? Yep. So, wal bara'atu min ash-shirk wa ahli. To disassociate. from the shirk and its people okay you cannot embrace tawhid unless you reject the shirk you cannot worship allah exclusively unless you've disbelieved in the taghut and you must recognize that if somebody is worshiping other than allah they cannot be muslim because that is what makes somebody muslim is that you don't worship other than Allah that you don't commit shirk and you recognize that the ummah of Tawheed the ummah of Islam and the ummah of all the people of shirk are separate there are two distinct camps so if you do not recognize that if you don't know the difference between who is a Muslim who is a Kafir how do you know you yourself are a Muslim? if you don't know the difference between is this man a Muslim or a Kafir? You know, then how do you know even you whether you are a Muslim or a Kafir? There must be certain factors, certain foundations. I'm not talking about minute uh, fiqh of takfir. I'm talking about the main foundations of the deen. Anybody, ask a child. Do Christians believe that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? They'll say no, because, you know, because they're not Muslim. If a Muslim, he says, came along and said, look, I don't believe Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. It's because he's not really Muslim. You cannot be Muslim without to know. Without to know, La ilaha illallah, that there's none worthy to worship beside Allah. Without to know that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. You cannot be Muslim without these points, without these topics. So, that's why it is definitely important for us to recognize there is a duty to make takfir upon the mushrikeen. Takfir upon those who commit shirk in Allah. Whoever associates partners with Allah, they cannot be Muslim. They cannot be good people, worshippers, salihun. It's not possible. Because everything about the Qur'an, there is no chapter of the Qur'an except that Allah condemns the mushrikeen and declares them in hellfire and warns people from the shirk. How can it be you miss that message? You read the Qur'an, you, read them, you miss that message. How is that possible? So there's no way that anybody you know, can enter Islam and they didn't give up the shirk because they didn't really enter. That means they didn't really enter Islam. Okay? Maybe they still drink alcohol. It's possible. Maybe they still have other mistakes. They listen to some music, or maybe they, you know, uh, have a girlfriend. They couldn't give her up. You know, it's possible they commit these sins. But if they didn't give up the kufr, they didn't give up their old religion. They didn't leave their previous religion. Then they didn't really become Muslim. So in Mecca. The Prophet وسلم, was asking the people to give up worshipping the idols. Imagine somebody said, okay, I believe Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, but I don't stop worshipping Hubbal. I didn't stop worshipping Lat. What would you, you, what you say about him? You say, this person is not a Muslim. And if he claimed to enter Islam, then he returned to worshipping the idol, you say he's an apostate. Okay, because that is, that will take somebody out of the Islam. So now, the question of what is al adir Because that's what we really titled the talk about. I mentioned this as introduction to that because this is the main point which is agreed upon by everybody. Agreed upon among the Salaf. Agreed upon among the Khalaf, the people after. Agreed upon among all of the Muslims in the world today. Okay? And obviously I'm excluding Mushrikeen like the Nusayris and the Alawis and things like this because they're not Muslim. Okay? But even you find government preachers, they will recognize these topics, these points. And it's mentioned in uh, the uh, Risala of about the 10 negations of Iman by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. He mentioned that uh, 
uh, one of the negations is the one who does not make takfir on the mushrikeen or does not make takfir on the Jews and Christians or he thinks that the deen is correct then, or he said even if he doubts their kufr then they are disbelievers so this was mentioned by Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab and he's quoting as well from the Salaf Imam Shafi'i said the same thing he said whoever doubts the kufr of the Jews and Christians or thinks that the deen has, is correct then they are mushrik, then they are kafir they are disbelievers right? the same thing Ibn Taymiyyah he said that whoever doubts their, the kufr yeah, they are disbelievers so this is something which is a common theme throughout the whole history and Allah says in Surah Mumtahin verse 4 Surah 60 verse 4 Okay, so this is in particular. Allah says, "قَدْ كَانَتْ لَكُمْ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ فِي إِبْرَاهِيمٍ وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ." He said, "There's a good example for you to follow in Ibrahim and those with him." إِذْ قَالُوا لِقَوْمِهِمْ إِنَّا بُرَآءُ مِنْكُمْ When they said to their people, "We are free from you. We have bara'a from you." وَمِمَّا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ And everything you worship instead of Allah. كَفَرُنَا بِكُمْ we have disbelieved in you. I mean, you and what you worship instead of Allah. We disbelieve in your gods. It's not true. You claim that, that, that you know, this idol is worthy of worship. This idol is a god to be worshipped. I don't believe in it. I disbelieve in that. I am kafir in that ta'ut. This is what this, this is what it means. Kafaru nabikum. We disbelieve in what you worship. And we call you kafir. Because you, we are kafir in your religion. You are kafir in my religion. We are not the same. We don't have loyalty, no brotherhood. We are not one ummah. We are not united. We are not one entity. We make that distancing yourself, distinguishing yourself. That's why when we say Idharuddin, we say distinguishing your fire from their fire. If you live between the people, what will the people think about you? You're living among mushrikeen. Above you is a taghut. Around you are mushrikeen, obeying and worshipping that taghut. And following that taghut, obeying his laws, going to his courts for judgment, and you're sitting between them among them. What would people think except that you're mushrik just like the rest of them? On the apparent. Unless you say openly, unless you distinguish yourself and say, wait, in case there's any confusion, nobody should think that I am with these people. Everybody should understand, I am free from them and what they worship instead of Allah. I am free from them and their taghut that they are obeying and following. That's the one who has made Idharuddin, has made Bara'a from the, from the Ta'ala. I don't mean somebody, he sits, he sits at home and on Facebook he goes under, under a, a hidden uh, kunya name that nobody recognizes. It says Abu Anonymous and goes, yes, you're all mushrikeen, this is my Bara'a. But then he goes out uh, in the streets as if like, you know, nobody would know. That's not called Idharuddin. You know, you're talking to somebody in Australia telling them that yeah, 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 yeah everybody's mushrik. That's, uh, but you're in the UK. How is that called Bara'a from the Shirk and his people? How is that called Idharuddin? No, Idharuddin is when you go out in front of the people and you say to them like Ibrahim salam said, we are free from you. Your kufr, I don't believe in it. That taghut you obey, I don't believe in it. This man-made law you obey is not my, my law. That's what Ibrahim salam did. That's the example we're supposed to follow. Kafaruna bikum. We have disbelieved in you and what you worship instead of Allah. وَبَدَا بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةُ وَالْبَغْضَاءُ أَبَدًا حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَحْتَى And he has appeared, not, you know, I've hidden. You know, Allah didn't say, a good example for you in Ibrahim, when he said to himself, I just believe in the, what they worship of Allah. No, he said, إِذْ قَالُوا لِقَوْمِهِمْ When he said to their people. They said it to their people. Let them hear, let them know that they are not the same. وَبَدَا بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ and it has appeared, it's become apparent, it's prevailed, it's not hidden, it's not a secret. It is apparent between you and us is only what? Al Adawa to Wal Baghda. Animosity and hatred forever. Until you believe in Allah alone. I mean, unless they enter the Tawheed, there's only bara between the Muwahideen and the Mushrikeen. There's only this disassociation and animosity and hatred and takfir. That is the Conditions of Kufr bi taghut That's the conditions of making bara'a from the mushrikeen That you make it clear We are not friends We are not united We are enemies We are from a different religion You are not from the Muslims that I am from You don't follow my religion And I don't follow your religion That is called bara'a from the mushrikeen 
So now, why is this so controversial? It's something that you know has been mentioned in so many of the books, it's mentioned everywhere. So why is it controversial now? And where does this term Al-Adr come into it as well? In order to understand some of these things, I think you know, and there was a suggestion of somebody to, as well to do a short glossary of some of these terms. So, and it is part of Usul al-Fiqh where we talk about the, the uh, terminologies and the, the uh, istalahat, the words and particular terms we use. We use for us to define them and explain them. And so people understand where they come from, what is referring to, and especially the Sharia terminology. And so I do want to give a little introduction into that first as well. Okay. So before we go further, let's look at some of these terms, inshallah. So some of the terms we want to look at include at takfir. And you can add any terms that you've heard that you're not sure about what they mean. Mean, I'll explain them for you, inshallah. Now. Okay, so we want to look at the word at takfir. What is it? We want to look at the word al-kafir. Okay. I want to explain the term jahid, the term al-mustahil, okay. mustahil, okay. and obviously from here by extension the word juhud and the word istihlal. Okay. Just very briefly explaining these terms, like a little dictionary uh, term, first of all. Okay. Al-Mawani' okay, Al-Takfir What does this refer to? We could talk about the word Al-Hujjah okay, and, and by extension there's two other things Iqamat Al-Hujjah and Bayan Al-Hujjah We could talk about at the thabut at tawakuf is another term you need to learn about tawakuf and of course this term al adir talk about al udru bil jahl There's something that people call Jahlul Hal. Jahlul Hal. Uh, also, people they use the term Adamul uh, Qasad. Or Irtifa'ul Qasad. Okay, so we'll look at all these terms, inshallah, each one of them. Is there any other terms that we want to add to that? Somebody's heard, they haven't, they're not for sure about when we talk about takfir and these discussions that go on. Okay, if anybody online have any, have any terms they want to add to that as well, I can look at each other as well. Kafir Asri, yeah, Al Murtad, that's a good point. I'll put that at the top, actually. Al Murtad, we need to put in there definitely. Murtad, Kafir Asli. Okay, Kafir Asli. What else? Yeah, I'll put the Al Murtad, inshallah. Uh, Al Murtad or Kafir Murtad. Uh, anything else you want to add? Okay. Uh, Nawaqid is what we talk about. Nawaqid. Okay. Let's see if we can stick this in somewhere. Okay, yeah. Nawaqid and Zindik, we can add that in here to fill the gaps. Zindik or Zandaka, anything else? Okay, if we get all the words in now, then we'll go through them one by one, inshallah. And probably we might only get this far for today's session, and inshallah, next week, hopefully. I mean, uh, I want people to really study this topic properly and really take notes and be clear about everything. Because when you talk about this topic of takfir, and the excuses of ignorance and when is it when is it when is it not valid and who do we make takfir on and something called chain takfir that's the other thing we'll talk about is taslil okay taslil 
جين تكفير اوكي okay. uh, accuracy is so important because put, putting the same statement in an inaccurate way is could be falling into the misguidance and dalala and bid'a and even aqeed of the khawarij and you give people room to suspect you and accuse you of being from the khawarij because maybe you didn't understand the exact terminology so you use the term before you realize what it meant and so you want to say something which is correct but because you're putting it in the wrong words you end up saying something which is actually technically wrong and the people because we are living in a time where everybody is scrutinized especially anybody who is not pro-government not pro tahut anybody who is you know opposing the tawhid regimes they are scrutinized more than everybody, everybody else you know and this is one thing you know i remember one uh, one brother was talking about with sheikh omar you see with sheikh omar sheikh omar Bakri, i'm talking about because every word is scrutinized and checked and and you know tested and, and people try to refute it and counter it and they challenge you Give me evidence, where's the evidence, where's the reference Everything, is you said that, I want to see the reference Give me exact hadith number, everything So then he has to ch check everything And bring the references, bring the evidences So that's why we have so many evidences for each of those points that we, we, we talk about Whereas the, if you look, if you think about it carefully When you look to the government preachers And they make a little statement here or there Mujahideen Khawarij the rulers are ulil amr, we have to obey them. They don't bring evidences. And nobody challenges them with evidences. Because they are, he's the big sheikh, he's the man of PhD, he's the doctor, doctor. You know, he's the one from the university. He is this man, he's, he's been bad, how can you stop it? How can you account? Nobody will question them. Nobody actually says to them, you know, sheikh, where's the evidence for that? Because they feel rude. How can you possibly ask him for evidence? He must have evidence. He wouldn't speak without evidence. So those people get away with saying things without bringing evidence, without addressing the points. Whereas people like us, we don't. We have to be, we're scrutinizing everything, so we have to answer. And that's why we answer, that's why we have to be extra careful as well. Because they make many, those government preachers make many blanket statements, many ambiguous words, and dodging the issue, twisting the facts, and nobody can really challenge them. But if you make a small mistake, even if you are correcting what you are saying, we make a small mistake in your wording, people will you know, make a mistake. And you have as well on, on, on both sides, not just government preachers will do that. Other people as well, some people, they want to make you to make takfir on people in a particular way. And if you don't do it in that particular way, they will call you kafir. To that extent. You know? If you call him apostate, you didn't call him kafir asli, you kafir. You know? Is that correct? Is it not correct? No, that's something we can talk about, but you can see how just a little wording, one word, it could, it could make a big difference. Somebody will, some people will be upset with you if you say, Akhi, how many Muslims are there in the world? Akhi, a billion Muslims, two billion Muslims, you know, Allah knows. I don't know. I never checked, I never counted, nobody's checked. And the guy asking you, he's never checked. Nobody really counted anybody. But we just, you know, and if I'm talking to the kuffar and they're asking, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say to them, look, you don't want to go to war with over 2 billion Muslims. I'm trying to scare him. I'm not going to say to him, yeah, I know two Muslims. You should be scared. He's not going to be scared of you. But people will say to you, how can you say there are 2 billion Muslims in the world? They are all mushrik. You make the cure of mushrikeen. You see? So some people will pull up on even the smallest word. So you need to be so, careful, so accurate, so careful in what you say. So what are these terms? Kafir asli. Okay? Kafir asli. The word kafir refers to the one who covers something up. You say Allah described the kuffar you know, uh, or the farmers in the Quran. Allah mentioned the kuffar as farmers or farmers as kuffar because they cover the seed with the ground, with the earth. They put the seed down and they cover it with the earth. So this is called the kafir covering it up. You have kufran and ni'mah. You say the one who is kafir because they cover up the blessing of Allah or cover up the blessing. So they are ungrateful. The one who is not grateful, they don't say thank you. The one who does not show gratitude, he is covering up the blessing that they've got. You know? Describe the women who are ungrateful to their husbands as they are what? As kufr, as ungratefulness. Not as the kufr makes them a disbeliever. 
So this is linguistically what the word uh, uh, kufr or, ka uh, or kafir is referring to. In relation to Islam, we are talking about the one who does not believe in the religion of Islam. That is called kafir. It's not what some people they think it means, mulhid, atheist. They think if you don't believe in God, then you're a kafir. But some akhi, Jews and Christians, they believe in God, so you can't call them kafir. No, the Jews and Christians don't believe in Islam. Therefore, they are kafir. It's not about if you believe in God or you don't believe in God. Most people believe in God. The Quraysh believed in God. They believed in Allah. But they believed Allah had daughters. And they believed in you know, 300 idols as well. And worshipped those instead of Allah. So instead of having monotheism, instead of having tawheed, only worshipping Allah exclusively, they started to uh, make idols and worship the idols instead of worshipping Allah. So you see, it's not the issue about believing in Allah or not. So the kafir asli is the one who was born as a, from a kafir family, to parents who were Jews and Christians. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kulli mawludin yuladu ala al-fitra. Every newborn child is born on the fitra. The fitra of what? Of tawheed. So we are born with the tawheed. We are born knowing Allah is one. We are not ignorant about that. And this is one thing we should be clear from this, understand. Nobody can be ignorant about Tawheed because we are born with the knowledge of Tawheed. We are born on the Tawheed. That is our starting point. That is our starting point. Every newborn child is born with the Tawheed. Then he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, but his parents make them Jews or Christians or fire worshippers. So the parents make them Jews or Christians or fire worshippers. So if you are born to Jewish parents, you are a Jew. You are kafir asli. You are Jewish. If you are born to Christian parents, you are Christian. You are kafir asli. If you are born to Hindu parents, you are Hindu. Then you are kafir asli. Okay, so that's what makes somebody kafir asli. And even though they were born in the Tawheed, but they became mushrik because of their parents. They, be, they attributed to that. If when they become mature, they start to be, even, you know, before they mature, even when they started to, you know, should be able to show uh, discernment and they start to declare the shahada, we'll call them Muslim. We'll say that they're Muslim. But otherwise, they'll be attributed to their own parents. Okay, attributed in particular to the father. But in general, to the parents, they will be attributed to their own, their own religion. So that is the kafir asli. Okay, so this is the original non-Muslim. Born to Kafir parents. Okay. Okay, and Kafir, uh, you know, disbelievers. Okay, or the Kafir is two types. I'm gonna rub this out, inshallah. This is the this is what a Muslim is. Muslim is the one who does this. And so, what is the Kafir? Kafir is two times. Kafir asli, okay, or murtad. Okay, so the kafir asli is the one born to non-Muslim parents. Is that an excuse for them? Even on the day of judgment, is it an excuse for them? No, because they were born on the fitrah. They were born with the knowledge of tawheed. They were born already testifying to the tawheed. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah, uh, Surah Anfal, okay, Surah Anfal, no, I think Surah, Surah Araf, sorry. Yeah, Surah Araf, verse 172. Okay, so Surah 7 verse 172. Okay, Surah 7 verse 172. Allah says, Allah said, and look when Allah brought forward all the children of Adam from the back of Adam. 
and he made them testify to themselves. Testify against themselves. Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your only Lord? Am I not your Lord? Qalu bala shahidna. And they said, all of them said, all of the children of Adam, all of humankind, in one place Allah brought them before we were born this life. And we testified, indeed we testify. And taqulu yawm al qiyamati inna kunna an hadha ghafirin. In case you came on the day of judgment claiming we didn't know about that. So nobody can go on the day of judgment claiming I didn't know about the tawheed. I didn't know Allah was my Lord to be worshipped exclusively. I thought it was, you know, uh, Lat or Uzza. I thought it was the cross or Jesus. They can't do that. They can't say that. And if that wasn't enough, People will say, Akhi, but what about people? It's not their fault. They were born to non-Muslim parents. Their, pa- no, their parents are the ones who, who convinced them. You know, you're going to punish them because of their parents? No. Or you're about, even after they grew up and became adult and they could think for themselves? Why do they stick to what their parents told them when, they, when it's obviously not the truth? أَوْ تَقُولُوا إِنَّمَا أَشْرَكَ آبَاؤُنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَكُنَّا ذُرِّيَّةً مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ أَفَتُهْلُكُنَا بِمَا فَعَلَ الْمُبْتِلُونَ I said, or, okay, so said either they would make an excuse, we didn't know about it, or they will say, it was just our parents that were mushrik. It was our parents that became mushrik, that committed the shirk before us. And we were just their children after them. Are you going to destroy us because of what those, those mushrikeen did, what those evil people did? You see, on the day of judgment, they'll be cursing their own parents, you know, for making them. Uh, uh, mushrikeen. So, and this is how we explain to you our verses so that you can return to them. So, this is Surah 172 to 173. Put there, inshallah. Okay, or 174 even. What do we cited there? Okay. So, those who are born to non Muslim parents, they are not excused. And on the day of judgment, they cannot claim we didn't know. That is not an excuse for them. It's not an excuse for them in this life, nor is it an excuse for them in the hereafter. To say, we didn't know that Allah should be worshipped. You know, it was just our parents that told us that. It's not good enough. And if it's not an excuse for them, what about the one who definitely knew and testified to it even in this life and said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then he worshipped other than Allah. How can he have an excuse for ignorance? Could he have an excuse of ignorance? But the same thing, we don't give excuse to those Jews and Christians. Are we going to give that excuse to now somebody who is supposed to be Muslim? Or somebody who says with his tongue, Allah is the only one who should be worshipped, followed and obeyed. Then he worshipped, follows and obeys somebody else. Okay, so that's the question. So now you have the second type of kafir, which is the murtad. Okay, the murtad. So the murtad are those who... Used to be Muslim, then committed okay, apostasy, okay, became disbelievers. Okay, also or we'll put here, then became disbelievers. Okay, then became disbelievers. Yeah, Allah Subhanahu wa says that some of the examples of these in Surah There's one verse I want to, a couple of verses I want to bring here. One is in Surah 5, verse 54, Surah Ma'idah, verse 54, and the other one is Surah Tawbah, verse 66. So, I'm going to put those on the board, Shana, quickly. Surah Tawbah verse 66 
and so 5 verse 54. Okay, when Allah Ta'ala mentioned about the murtad. Allah Ta'ala says uh, about those who mock Islam, He said, لا تعتذروا قد كفرتم بعد إيمانكم. He said, don't make excuses. You are disbelievers after you had Iman. Okay, so after you used to have Iman, you after you used to be believers, then you became disbelievers. That's Surah Tawbah verse 66. And the other one, Surah Ma'idah verse 54, Allah Ta'ala warned us. He said, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ يُحِبُّونَ He said, oh you who believe, whoever apostates from his deen, turns back from his deen, Allah will replace you with people who love him, or Allah loves them and they love him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So, murtad. So this is the... the the second term over here as well, the apostate. Okay, so apostate. This is from the term, you know, uh, to go, turn back, to slide back, or to go back, to revert back to something. So when somebody he was upon the kufr, you know, after he entered Islam, he reverted back to his kufr. He went back to the kufr. Was somebody he who was a Muslim, and he. Uh, turned away from Islam, turned back from Islam, turned his back on Islam, became an apostate. And that's the way the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Man bedda ladinu faqtulu." The one who changes his religion, whoever changes his religion, then uh, execute him. And he has capital punishment. Okay, obviously after you offer him to repent and so on. So the kafir asli, we can put them as three types. Okay, put them as three types, and they are all mushrik. Okay, so three types of mushrik. Three types of mushrik, okay, which is kafir asli. And I, I should stress here as well, what I'm talking about here is classification. Just like some of these terms, they are just classification by the scholars. They are not necessarily all sharia terms found in the Quran and the Sunnah. Sometimes, is what the ulama they define and use to explain the people to categorize the things to help you understand to help make it easier for you to digest the information like when we talk about the words wajib mandub mubah makru you know these terms are not things which are be defined by the sharia specifically by text it's classification by the ulama and that's why people can have different opinions about it you don't need to use the same terms okay people have different terminology so you got here mushrik from people of the book okay i.e. Jews Christians Mushrik not from the people of the book E.g. Hindus, Sikhs, Greeks, etc. Okay. Number three, atheists. Well, atheist mushriks up here. Because people misunderstand. People think if he's atheist, he's not a mushrik. No, if he's atheist, he's the biggest mushrik of all. He's the worst of all the mushriki. The atheist. He worships himself and he gives all the rights of Allah to himself. He's the one like Fir'aun. He's the biggest Taghut of all. He's the one who said, There is no God except for me. He says to the people, I'm going to go to the heavens and see if there's a God of Musa. But I think he's lying. There's no God. He said, I am your highest Lord. I decide that illegal and illegal, lawful and unlawful. I am the highest judge. Come to me with your disputes. He is the worst of all. Okay? So, atheist mushriks. You know, the including here, we have, we're talking about here, the secular, communists, okay? People forget these things are, these people, communists, socialists, they are the atheists, okay? There are people who, you know, worship themselves, okay? Humanists, they call themselves, some of them. 
Okay, they call themselves humanists, meaning they worship the human. They don't think they're worshiping them, but of course they're worshiping them. You know, they like to run away from the term religion. You know, but this is a religion, or it's a deen. We don't need to use the term religion. English is just not good enough to deal with these things. They have a deen. Their deen it is to worship themselves, worship human beings. Let human beings follow the, uh, uh, you know, follow each other, worship each other, and make their own laws and decide what is right and wrong and so on. So these are all of these are disbelievers. Okay, these are all disbelievers. And in general, anybody, any one of them, anybody who does not believe in Islam, they are called a kafir. And they could be a kafir in this life, as far as we can see, judging by the apparent, and kafir on the hereafter as well. Or it could be, we see them as kafir in this life, but perhaps there is something which saves them from the hellfire in the hereafter. For example, they didn't commit the shirk. So you have something called Ahl al-Fatra, the people who are who of, who never, you know, in between the prophets, who never heard or reached the knowledge of any of the prophets, you know, those are people who they'll be accounted differently. And it depends really if they stuck to their stuck to their fitra of the Tawheed or if they start committing the shirk, and Allah will deal with them however He wishes. But if anybody heard of Islam from all of these and they didn't believe in Islam, then they are disbelievers, you know, they have no excuse. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever hears my name and did not believe on me, has no excuse on the Day of Judgment. He has no excuse on the Day of Judgment. So that is, in other words, anybody who does not believe in the messengership of Muhammad ﷺ, they are called Kafir Asli. Here, or they are called Kafir. If they, if they are born into that, and they never entered Islam in their life, then they are called Kafir Asli. The Kafir Murtad, you can, just, you can divide it up into three types. And again, this is just classification. It doesn't really matter if you want to use these terms, or want to use something else. The first one is the Jahid. Okay, so Jahid. And over here, we have this word over here, the Jahid. Okay, so Jahid is anybody who, okay, one who denies anything Allah revealed. Okay, so they could deny the whole Quran, they could deny part of the Quran, they could deny um, you know the existence of the angels, for example, when Allah said in the Quran the angels exist. They could deny the messengers, despite Allah saying in the Quran, in the revelation, that uh, the messengers were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They could deny a particular hukum, a particular ruling. If it's something known from Islam by necessity, not open to ishtihad, okay, so which is a clear cut in the Quran, and they deny it, then they are disbelievers. Allah said, وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا الْكَافِرُونَ Okay, so this is Surah uh, An Kabut. I'll give you the surah, inshaAllah, this verse. Okay, so surah Ankabut. Okay, Surah 29, verse 47. Okay, Surah 29, verse 47. So, okay, Allah says, Nobody denies our verses except for the disbelievers. Except for the disbelievers. So it could be that somebody who entered Islam, embraced Islam, 
But he just could not accept something from the Qur'an Despite Allah revealing it to him So for example, he could not accept the um, prohibition of alcohol, for example So he said, no, no, it's not, you, you know, it's, you, it can't be right, that can't be true Or the duty of jihad He said, no, no, I deny it, it's not fard Jihad is not fard, jihad is haram This type of thing, or he said, you don't have to pray, nobody needs to pray uh, or he says, no, the, uh, the paradise is not real, Jannah is not real The one who denies the verses of Allah, contradicting clearly Is like the one basically, he's making what's called takdeeb, juhud, takdeeb Means he's, de- he's saying it's not true Okay, Like if I say to you, brother, so-and-so, uh, sheikh, he has two wives, two wives And he said, no brother, it's not true So you deny it, you disbelieve me, basically you're saying to me, I'm wrong I got it wrong, or even worse, I'm a liar. Okay, this is called takdeeb. Okay, the way we have tasdiq, tasdiq means I believe what you're saying is the truth. Takdeeb is the opposite of that. Means I believe what you're saying is not true. I believe it's a lie. I believe it's falsehood. It's wrong. Okay, so we say sadaq, we say sadaq Allah. People say some people say sadaq Allah or adi. They say Allah, you know, spoken the truth. So basically, when you make takdeeb or juhud, you're saying kazab Allah. Allah lied. That's what you're saying. So when somebody, when Allah said alcohol is haram. Okay, or Allah said, Salah five times a day is fard. You must pray five times a day. And somebody comes along and says, Nope, it's not true. He is saying, Allah lied. Allah got it wrong. And that is called juhud, is kufr. Okay, it's called kufr. The second one, mustahil. Okay, and that's over here, mustahil. He makes istihlal. That means he's one who makes halal, okay, i.e., legalizes, put it this way, what Allah made haram. And obviously, this is what the Jews and Christians did, the rabbis and priests did. And Allah called them Tawhut because of that. In Surah Tawbah verse 31, Allah says, اتخذوا أحبارهم ورهبانهم أربابا من دون الله They took their rabbis and priests as laws instead of Allah. Why? Because they made halal whatever Allah made haram, and haram whatever Allah made halal. So that is what made them uh, uh, mushrikeen and Tawhut. And the people obeyed them. Okay? They are one unit. The rabbis and those who obeyed them, they are together. They are all mushrikeen. And then you have, you know, the rulers in the Tawaheed. When they start to legalize things and they say, actually, you know, Allah said that we should, le- we should prohibit and make it illegal for people to gamble and to have brothels and to have, you know, adultery and pornography. But I say it's legal. I say it's okay. So, you know, you know it's okay. Just get a license from me, permission, and, you know, we'll uh, uh, give you permission to do that. That is called istihlal. That's called istihlal. It's called legalizing what Allah made haram, which is known from Islam and necessity, clear cut matters. Not a matter of ishtihad, matter of direct contradiction to what Allah Taala has prohibited. The third one is we say naqid. Okay. So naqid mean okay, okay, this is the one who denies, denier, legalizer. And Naqid, the one who negates. Okay. So the third one is if he commits or he does one of the negations of the Iman. And you'll see we can take from Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab's 10 negations of Iman as a summary of those. Whoever commits one of those 10 negations of Iman, then he has nullified his, his Islam. After he had Islam, he committed those and he became therefore a murtad, an apostate, okay, or a kafir or mushrik again because of that. Okay. So that's what the term naqid. And so we have here nawaqid. I put here nawaqid. So these are the negations. Okay. So the way you have something that will negate your wudu, something will nullify your wudu. You had wudu, you went to the toilet. You don't have wudu anymore. You had iman. You worshipped an idol, you don't have Iman anymore. This is the way the Naqid works. 
So certain actions you do will nullify and negate your iman. You don't have this you know, uh, special protection. Once you say the kalima, after that you can never become kafir. It's not like that. Rather, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there will come fit time come a time with a fitna where a man he will go in the evening as a believer and by the morning he's a kafir. He'll wake up in the morning as a believer and by the evening he's a kafir. So you see, so easy for somebody to come in and out of Islam. So the way you enter Islam with one word by saying Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, you become kafir by one word as well. So easy like that. So if somebody commits one of those negations, in this case we're talking about negations of Iman. Okay, if you commit one of those negations of Iman, you will therefore leave the fold of Islam, you become from the Murtad, the Murtaddeen. Okay, you become from the apostates. So now, the question is really, and I'm not going to go into the 10 negations uh, today. I want to look at some of these other terms, inshallah, here as well. Okay, so the Kafir, he said, we said here is... I mentioned the word kafir here. Okay. One who is not Muslim. Okay. It's not a swear word. Okay. The one who disbelieves in something. Okay. So the kafir, when we just mentioned the word kafir like this, your mind should go to somebody who disbelieves in Islam. And there's no harm for somebody to say the word the other way around. I am a disbeliever in Christianity. I don't believe in it. I'm a kafir in Christianity. I'm proud of it. No problem. I'm a kafir in Hinduism. You know? Alhamdulillah. And they are kafir in Islam. They're disbelievers in Islam. There's nothing to be ashamed of about, you know, about using these terms. Okay. So now, what about takfir? Where does takfir come into it? At takfir, one thing we should remember, and this is quite an important point we should remember, Remember I said to you some terms are not Sharia terms from the Quran and the Sunnah It's just terms used by the scholars to classify things to help us understand To help us to digest the information easier At takfir is not a term found in the Quran and the Sunnah It's not a term even used by the Salaf okay? And I don't mean by the Salaf somebody who died yesterday I'm talking about the Salaf, the Sahaba, the companions and if I want to say further, in the first three generations, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and the Tabi'a Tabi'een. They never used this term, takfir. Does that mean the concept did not exist? No, of course it existed. Of course it existed. But the term takfir is not one of those terms. And you know, out from some of these terms here, you know, this word takfir, I'm going to highlight which ones you know, uh, sort of came later. This issue of takfir, is new, is a new term. Okay, when we talk about al adir is a new term. Talk about al udr bil jahl is a new term. Jahl al hal is a new term. Okay, even these terms, adam al qasad, you know, irtifa al qasad, you know, to some extent even taslil, the term itself, these are new terms. So don't get confused. And the the you see the 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 thing about new terms is that different scholars, they will define them in different ways. And they will use them in different ways. So when this scholar talks about takfir, he's talking about one thing. And when that scholar uses the word takfir, he's talking about something else. And then when the students start to fight each other, and debate with each other, they get confused. Because they're saying, Akhi, this is takfir. And he's thinking, no, that's not how my sheikh explained it. But actually, they said the same thing. Okay. For example, takfir, literally, literally it can mean, linguistically, it can literally mean either you make somebody kafir, or it can mean that you call somebody kafir. Okay. You are declaring or claiming somebody is kafir. That is what takfir could mean. Okay. So somebody will use the word takfir in relation to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam when he said, whoever says to his brother, ya, ya kafir, o kafir, then... Is as if he killed him. Or that one of them is a kafir. The kufr will come back to one of them. So this, you know, this hadith is talking about dispraising the one who calls a Muslim kafir out of anger, out of desires, out of, you know, arguing with him, hezbiyah, whatever reason. Without, because, without there being any real grounds for that kufr, for that takfir. So this is called takfir. So somebody will say, Akhi, that's called takfir. Don't do it. Beware of takfir. Akhi, don't ever make takfir. Takfir is haram. 
Because he's talking about that issue. Because that hadith, technically, what did he say? He never used the word takfir in the hadith. But he said in the hadith, whoever says to his Muslim brother, you're a kafir. Okay? That could be called takfir. Because, you know, takfir means to call somebody kafir. To say, so-and-so is a kafir. Okay? That's called takfir. Okay? But does it mean that nobody can ever become kafir? And you can't call them kafir? No. The Prophet sallallahu he called Musaylimah an apostate, kafir. He, he's somebody who embraced Islam. And then he said, no, I'm a prophet as well. And Muhammad sallallahu said, no, he's Musaylimah kathab, the liar. Yeah? And he's an apostate. So, is, it, is there apostasy? Yes. That's also called takfir, but it's not, called, it's not dispraised. There's nothing wrong with that. So you have these two types. So one scholar will start talking about, you know, what the ulama used to say. Whoever did not make takfir on the mushrikeen, they are kafir. And the other one saying, Akhi, don't make takfir, takfir is bad, takfir is evil. Because he's talking about the hadith about the one who calls Muslim kafir. And he's talking about, he must make takfir, because he's talking about takfir on the mushrikeen. And that's what ulama said. Other ulama, when they use the word takfir, in this context, they're absolutely correct. Other people that will say, the takfir, Akhi, Akhi, takfir only talks about an apostate. It's not about the Jews and Christians. It's not about the Mushrikeen. They say, no, okay, when we talk about takfir, we don't, we're not talking about okay, Jews and Christians. Because they will say to your brother, do you make takfir on the Mushrikeen? They say, no, 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 brother, we don't, there's nothing called takfir on Mushrikeen. Because the Mushrikeen, they're already kafir. You know, we only make takfir on uh, a Muslim if he becomes an apostate. So in their mentality of those scholars, you only talk about takfir in relation to apostate, the murtad, not about these ones. Okay? Which one is correct? They're all correct because it's a matter of classification. When you classify the terms, the new terms, it is permissible to use the terms, any terms you like, as long as you don't confuse or change the uh, subject matter. So as long as it's explained properly and you don't confuse between the two. He says, don't make takfir, akhi. But he also says, but you must call the Jews and Christians kafir. And he also says, but you must call as one an apostate kafir. He's not denying that, but he's just saying, don't make takfir of hawa. Don't, you know, and again, this word takfir of hawa, okay, perhaps that's the term that I use. Other people don't use that term. Maybe they just call it takfir. So this is classification, it can confuse people. And, I've, and this is one of the most important things. Especially this term here, al-adir, is one which has confused a lot of people who are saying the same thing, but using different terms. And, you know, some people... They are trying to insist that you need to use my words. You have to use my terminology, otherwise they don't accept it. And that's wrong. Okay? I'll give you another example of how this uh, terminology can make a problem. You know? Imagine now, you went to a Shafi'i scholar and said, Sheikh, what's the hukum of you know, jihad? You know, we have occupation Muslim lands all over the world. Kufar entering our lands, you know, Palestine being been occupied for, you know, how many decades? Chechnya being de been occupied, Andalusia being occupied, Kashmir is occupied, and he was the hukum of jihad. We say to you, brother, the jihad is wajib. We cannot leave it. We must fight the jihad. It is wajib upon us. Compulsory obligation cannot be ignored. So then he went to a Hanafi scholar. Okay, so this is the Shafi'i scholar. Shafi'i scholar said it's wajib. He went to the Hanifi scholar and said, Sheikh, you know, Sheikh so and so said that the jihad is wajib. The Hanifi scholar will say, He's a liar. In fact, whoever says that the jihad is wajib is kafir. The jihad is fard. Why? Because in Hanifi fiqh, the word wajib is below fard. So both of them, and in Shafi'i fiqh, there's no, it doesn't use the word fard, they just use the word wajib, and there's nothing in between. Wajib and fard, the same thing, but they use different terms. And he uses the word wajib to mean one thing, and he uses the word wajib to mean something else. And both of them will say, anybody who doubts that the jihad is wajib, he was kaf, is what the Shafi'i scholar will say. And the other Hanifi scholar will say, anybody who doubts, anybody who says that the jihad is wajib only, instead of calling it fard, is kaf. Why? Because both of them want to say, you must fight the jihad. And the students will start fighting each other and say, Yahya, your sheikh's kafir. Why? Because they're not thinking and understanding how the scholars are using this terminology. And these terms, they can be defined and classified any way that they like. 
Okay, so the word takfir, if you want to use it in, you know, in all senses, you could say that it is to basically is to call, to declare those who committed what negates the iman, to declare them as a kafir. That could be the kafir asli, that they are mushrik to begin with, and so they are not Muslim. Or it could be an apostate because he left Islam, so he became an apostate. That's also called takfir. And it could be takfir hawa, the one who didn't really deserve it, but you, somebody called him the takfir you know, out of anger or of, arro of arrogance or partisan without to have any real verification or anything else. This is also called takfir, but called a dispraised takfir. So the takfir could be praised and it could be dispraised. Okay. So, so this is what the takfir really is. You know, if I leave it like that, it's to call somebody kafir. To call someone kafir. And that could be Ishtihad or it could be Hawa, desires and sin. Okay, so it could be either of those. Okay, so it could be somebody who did it out of Ishtihad properly, and so it could be somebody who did it out of Hawa, out of his desires, and that was a sin. Okay. What are Mawani of Takfir? Mawani of Takfir. Mawani of takfir refers to preventions of takfir. Okay, preventions of takfir. Okay, and even you could put in brackets here excuses. Sometimes there could be excuses, sometimes there might not be excuses, but they're called preventions of takfir. Mawani of takfir. What is a mani? For those who studied the usul, what is a mani? Definition. Okay. Now the mani or mawani of takfir is the prevention of takfir uh, or mani in general is the matter which is presence necessitates the absence of the rule. So it's something which because of this issue the rule must be prevented. So when you talk about mawani of takfir, the preventions of takfir means if that issue is present we need to hold back from the takfir. Okay, we need to hold back from the takfir. Okay, so that's called prevention of takfir. So that could be many things. It could be because of ignorance, could be because of interpretation, it could be because of duress, because he was insane, because he was a child, you know, not mature, because he was you know, sleepwalking or talking in his sleep. All of these circumstances mean we need to hold back from calling him a kafir because of this action. It could be other things. He's a new Muslim, living far away from the Muslims. All these circumstances need to, need to be looked into. Sometimes they are valid. Prevention of takfir, sometimes they're not valid prevention of takfir. Sometimes people make up preventions of takfir. They say, oh, he's blind. Blind is not a prevention of takfir. Okay? Being blind does not prevent takfir upon somebody. And there are many blind apostates in the past that have been executed by the Khulafa. You know, it's nothing, which, nothing new. So, you know, it's something which is about the person or about the circumstances, which means you must hold back from the takfir. Does that mean they're not kafir? Not necessarily. Maybe they are kafir, but you are not necessarily allowed to call them kafir because of that prevention of takfir. Because, for example, if he's under duress, if he's under duress, his actions and statements from his tongue no longer take him out the fold of Islam. They no longer count. But in his heart, if he's full of iman, then he's a believer. And if he's accepting the kufr with his heart, then he's the disbeliever. But you can't see his heart. So the one under duress who's committing kufr, he may or may not be a kafir. Only Allah knows. Because only Allah knows what's in the heart. But you cannot call him kafir because you cannot tell that from the, from the apparent. All you can see from the apparent is, he's doing kufr actions under duress. And under the duress, the kufr doesn't count. La ikraha fi deen. The way Islam does not count under duress, Kufr does not count under duress. The deen is not something which is measured under duress. You force somebody, become Muslim or I will kill you. If you say that to somebody and they embrace Islam, it doesn't count. If when he's free, he left it, we won't call him apostate. We'll say he's kafir asli, he never really entered Islam in the first place. Should, nobody should ever have even forced him. And the same thing, if you put a gun to somebody's head and say, you know, commit kufr. Make sujood to an idol. 
Pray to this grave. Otherwise, I will kill you. Even if he did it, that doesn't make him a kafir. It doesn't count. But if in his heart he loved it, he would become kafir. But only Allah knows that. So this mention, obviously, uh, about the duress issue okay, is mentioned in Surah, uh, Surah Nahal, verse 106. Surah 16, verse 106. Allah says, Man kafara billahi min ba'di imanihim, illa man bil iman. He said, whoever disbelieved in Allah after they had Iman, except for the one who was under duress. So you see now there's exceptions. So there are exceptions. He said, under the duress. And his heart was full of Iman. But you don't know what's in his heart. Nobody can see inside the heart, except for Allah. He said, but the one whose heart, his chest, was happy with the kufr, then he will have be cursed by Allah and the anger of Allah will be on, on, on him and a severe punishment. So in other words, even under the duress, if your heart was accepting of it, you become kafir. But only Allah knows about that. So the prevention of takfir is not about declaring that this person is innocent or not, or that the person is excused in front of Allah or not. But it's a matter of purifying your, your takfir to make sure you do not fall into making takfir of hawa. So is to purify your ishtihad in declaring somebody a kafir or not, to be free from any defect or any doubt or anything which could be uh, misunderstood or which could be a form of your own partisan. You know, because otherwise, if you're making takfir without proper grounds, when they could have an excuse or they could be an exception to it, then it could be that you only made takfir out of your own hatred for the person. Or out of your own partisan because you don't like his group or you don't like their, their group. He didn't give bay'ah to you. You didn't give bay'ah to his shaykh or whatever. So because of that, no, you start making takfir upon each other. If that's the case, it's wrong. So to purify your takfir and to purify myself in front of Allah to say, Oh Allah, I'm innocent of making wrong takfir you know, out of my own nafs and hawa. I only did it for your sake because of the clear evidences in front of me. Therefore, he stops from making takfir if he sees one of these preventions of takfir, one of these excuses, if it's valid. And in each one, he'll investigate as well. Is it real duress or not? Is it real ignorance or not? Is that ignorance valid, valid for this type of kufr or not? Because not for every type of kufr you can have ignorance. Okay, you can't, you, like we said, we can't excuse the Jews and Christians for their ignorance. But when they worship there, worship the cross. No. And if a Muslim worship the cross, you're going to give him excuse of ignorance? You should know even better. It should be better than the Christian to know you can't worship the cross. So, you know, with the prevention of takfir, you will look into it, investigate it as well. But that's what the prevention of takfir are about. Okay, again, it's not to say necessarily that because of that prevention, he is not kafir. But it's to say, I cannot declare, I cannot pass that fatwa of kufr upon him. Just like a person is innocent until proven guilty, he could be guilty. But if there's no proof against him, you cannot give a verdict against him. You know, you can't declare somebody a thief without witnesses. Maybe he was a thief, but you cannot declare it just unless you have evidence. You can't declare a woman or a man an, an adulterer without four witnesses. Even maybe he was, but nobody saw. But you can't accuse him of that. And in the same way with the takfir, you know, he may well be careful, but you cannot make the takfir if there is a valid prevention, a valid excuse, uh, or prevention of takfir, mani of takfir uh, for them. Okay? Okay, so this is mawani of takfir. What is the hujjah? Is that the next one? Yeah, hujjah. This is a very important term when we talk about this. And this is a better term for us to use than when we talk about al udr bil jahad. Okay? Because al hujjah is something which is found in the Quran and Sunnah. It's something which is mentioned in the Quran, mentioned in the, had the uh, Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a shari'i term, has specific divine meaning. Okay, so it refers to a binding argument. Okay, argument based on evidences. That has no rebuttal. And I'll put in brackets here, excuse. Okay? 
Essentially, it's an argument. If you think about it in court, it is you have a defense. You have an argument which is backed up by evidences, which is a defense against the accusations made against you. And that's what makes you have an excuse. That's why the hadith says uh, about those who hear the name of Muhammad وسلم, and don't believe in him. La hujja, la lahum yawm al -qiyama. They have no excuse on the day of judgment. No argument, no defense on the day of judgment. They can have nothing to say to Allah on the day of judgment to say, this is why I shouldn't go to hellfire. Why? Because they heard, they had opportunity, but they didn't take it. So the hujja is the binding argument based on evidences that has no rebuttal. You can't compete with it. Okay, because somebody could make an argument, but, but you could say, well, no, that's wrong because of so-and-so evidences. So the hujja one that has no rebuttal. So the hujja could be something for you or against you. Okay, the hujja could be for, for you or against you. So if some if the hujja is presented to you, the evidence, the argument is presented to you, and you hear it, and you still disbelieve, then you have no excuse on the day of judgment. You can't say on the day of judgment, how was I supposed to know? Because so-and-so told you. So-and-so showed you. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with the Qur'an. He recited it to you, his verses. The verses of Allah. And you knew that they were miraculous. You saw that they were miraculous. You heard the truth, but you chose not to believe in it. So now what excuse do you have on the day of judgment? So that is what the hujjah is about. If the hujjah reaches you or not. And then you have these two things here. Iqamatul hujjah and bayanul hujjah. Iqamatul hujjah meaning establishing okay. the arguments I'll put here okay so like we said if that hujjah that argument is made to you is presented to you you have no excuse on the day, day judgment and Allah Ta'ala said uh, about that so, hatta he said we will never punish people until we send to them a messenger, I mean until we establish a hujjah against them, in other words. Okay, so I'll find you this verse, inshaAllah. Surah 17, verse 15. Okay, Surah 17, verse 15. And there's another verse we want here as well, Surah 4 verse 165 okay. Surah 4 verse 165 Allah says that Allah sent uh, uh, messengers Rusulan wa Bashirin wa Mundirin li alla yakuna lil nasi ala Allahi hujjatun ba'da al-rusul He said that Allah sent the messengers with the glad tidings and the warnings so that mankind has no hujja excuse or argument or defense against Allah after the messengers came okay so in other words the messengers were sent to the people to establish the hujja against them one of the aims of the prophets and messengers was iqamatul hujja establishing the hujja he conveyed to them and then after that they chose to disbelieve and they have no excuse left after that okay so this is called iqamatul hujja establishing the argument or establishing the uh, the proof okay argument or proof we'll put here you know, against the people. Bayan al hujja is explaining or presenting the argument, okay, or the hujja, basically. What is the difference between these two? It's quite an important difference between the two. Bayan al hujja is for you to present to the person yourself and say to them, here, look, this is the proof, explaining it to you clearly. Iqamatul Hujja is the fact that it's been established, not necessarily by you. Okay? The Hujja reached him 
by whichever means, whichever way, and you called him kafir even though you never spoke to him. That could be the case. For example, the hujjah could be established by a scholar explaining the verses, presenting the evidences to the person, and so here is the evidences. Now what do you now how can you differ with that? That's one way. You know, especially in matters not known by necessity. Or it could be somebody was new Muslim as a child, they didn't know, they were living far away from the Muslims, so somebody they just explained to them. So this is how we pray. This is we have to pray five times a day. And so it was explained to them. So it reached them. Or it could be the hujja was the coming of the messengers themselves. Like the ayah said. After the messengers came, that was the hujja. They heard Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was the hujja. They had no excuse after that. Why? Because what is known from Islam by necessity is the clear cut, famous, agreed upon matters. You don't need to be a mushtahid. You don't need to have, you know, be half of hadith. You don't need to have anything like that. Clear, known. Everybody, even the kuffar know Muslims don't drink alcohol. You know, it's, it's known. So the coming of the messengers, the revelation of the Quran, it was the establishing of the hujja against the people in those clear cut matters, you know, except for very rare exceptions. And the tawheed, what about the tawheed? Allah established the hujja against you. Remember we said before? When Allah he brought everybody forward and He said, Testify against yourself now. Am I not your only Lord? Is Allah not the only one who worship? worship? And they said, indeed, we testify. So the hujjah had been established against themselves already about the tawheed. About la ilaha illallah. That's already established. So nobody needs to explain to somebody, oh, you didn't know there was a God? Of course he knew there was a God. He knew there was a God. He knew Allah was the only legislator, the only Lord, the only creator. Allah, they know that. From your own fitrah, you know it. From your own mind, rationally, you can see it. And that's why many kuffar you find, you know, many kuffar in this country, they don't believe in Christianity anymore, they're fed up. But they can't shake the belief that there must be a creator. Because it's so obvious. Because it just doesn't make sense. You have to be really arrogant to be a true atheist. You know? And this, this, is, this is just the case, as it is, You're saying it as it is. To be an atheist, you have to be really arrogant. Because, you know, and you have to be really irrational as well. Because any rational thinking person will understand you cannot have all of this around us and then not be a creator. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. That is not how things work. That is not the laws of nature. That is not the way you know, reality is. Things do not happen by themselves. You know, that just doesn't happen. So, the Tawheed the hujjah has been established against you already by your own fitrah, by your own natural instinct from your birth. So you don't need to have bayan al hujjah explaining to somebody beforehand. You don't need to go to you know the uh, the king of Saudi Arabia and explain to him, look, let me explain to you. There is a god. He sent Muhammad as a messenger with the Quran and the Sharia, and you know Allah is the only legislator. You don't need to explain that to him. You don't need to explain all that to him. The fact that he took himself as a legislator instead of Allah. And he knows what Allah, and he's, well, he's not ignorant anyway. He knows Allah legislated the law and Sharia. And he leaves it and he implements sharia, uh, kufr law instead. That is his kufr. He has hujjah established against him already. You don't need to explain to him. Okay. So the other terms. At-tawakkuf. At-tathabbut. At-tathabbut is what? Verification. And this is very important. Very important. Okay. And you see here, we have a question. And this is an important question. And we are going to continue with this next week as well. So you'll be able to get more information, inshallah, about what we're talking about this. On these issues of Iqamat al Hujjah, it's agreed that you don't make takfir upon somebody until the Hujjah has been established. That is what has been mentioned. That's what the ulama said. And some ulama will say it in general like this without to classic clarify further. Others will go into more detail. And they will explain, like I've explained, that the simple things like tawheed, you know, whether somebody heard about Islam or not, they are called a kafir in this life, as far as this life is concerned. They are called kuffar. And if they are committing shirk in Allah, then they have no excuse for that. 
even if there was no you know, nobody who came along to explain the hujjah. Why? Because the hujjah been established by Allah, by the fitrah. Okay? But still we say in general, we never make tafir upon somebody unless a hujjah has been established. Okay? Unless a hujjah has been established. Why do the kafir asli, why are the kafir asli called kufar, even if they never heard about Islam? Why? Because they don't believe in Islam. They don't believe in the religion of Islam. And the fitrah is a testimony against them for their own shirk that they're committing it, that they're committing. And it could be that they're muwahideen in this life and they never committed shirk but they never believed in Islam. And on the day of judgment, Allah could deal with them how they like. But as far as this world is concerned, this dunya is concerned, they just believe in Islam. They don't believe in Islam. So they are not called Muslims. They are called kuffar. You can only have those two. There's no third. Either Muslim or they are kafir. So, At-Tathabbut is essential for that reason, one of the reasons, to make sure that the Hujj has been established. And one of the ways you can make sure of that is by making Bayan on Hujja. If you're not sure if the Hujj reached him, tell him the Hujja, now you've got no more excuse. Remove any excuse. If he didn't know, okay, now I'll tell you, now you know. So this is why you have Bayan on Hujj. To check as well, verify that there are no Mawani' of Takfir, there are no possible preventions of Takfir. There are no possible things which should halt and stop you from making takfir. There is nothing you know, uh, that could suggest maybe he's innocent. He didn't do it. People get accused of things all the time. People accuse each other of being Mossad agent, MI5 agent, CIA agent all the time. You know, Before you start worrying about Akhi, does he have a Muwani of takfir? Akhi, he never did it in the first place. Before you start looking at Muwani of takfir, does he have a hujjah or not? Check if he's even guilty of the, of the, of the crime. No? If I accuse, you know, if I just accuse somebody, any old person, Zayd bin Ubaid, okay, he's a thief. I hope so, nobody's called Zayd here. Okay? I always use that name. One day I'm going to meet somebody called Zayd bin Ubaid. I'm going to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Zayd bin Ubaid, he's a thief. Akhi. He's a thief. So now we need to check. Does they meet the conditions of the, to cut the hands of the thief? Is it quarter of the, Akhi, Akhi, before you go to the conditions, check if he stole anything or not. Who told you he stole anything? You don't just believe a rumor. You need to have first have proof that they actually committed the crime. Then you talk about uh, preventions or not. At tawakkuf. At tawakkuf is holding back or, or putting something on hold. We say on hold. Okay. Tawakkuf means to stop. It is to stop. We say sometimes we talk about tawakkuf in relation to. Um, you know, certain ilm, certain knowledge, where we say we stop at the text, at tawqif. So we say, for example, people they talk about Khidr, alayhi salam, they say, is he a prophet or not? Dhul Qanain, is he a prophet or not? So Dhul Qanain, some people said okay, he's a prophet. Some people say, no, he's not a prophet. There's no proof that he's a prophet. So we say about Dhul Qanain, as we mentioned as well in the hadith, that we make tawqif, we stop. We neither say he is, neither we say he, he isn't. We say we don't know. Could be, couldn't be. So a tawakkuf is a way of saying, I don't know. It's a form of tafweed. A form of putting it pending to say, I leave it to Allah. Allah alone knows. I don't know the situation. So that could be the situation. MashaAllah. <laughs> could be, there's somebody, you see him on the kufur, but there's a big doubt in your mind about something about the reality. If he has an excuse or not. Is he guilty or not? You can, until you can check and verify further, you say, Akhi, I don't know. I can't answer. Somebody asks you, is he kafir? But Akhi, I need to check further. No, is he kafir? But I just need to check. Let me investigate. Akhi, is he kafir? Akhi, I only met him yesterday. Let me just check. Give me at least one day, at least three days. But is he kafir or Muslim? You have to tell me now. Has to be one or the other. Which one is it, Akhi? When are you going to call him kafir? Are you going to make takfir? Yeah, some people like this. So brother, you, you just told me, you know, and why am I going to take your word for it in the first place? You know, people told me, this sheikh says tahakum to the is allowed, that sheikh said it's allowed, this sheikh said voting is allowed. I said, why, do, why should I believe you? Just because you claim it's true, you want me to make takfir upon that? Based on some hearsay? I don't do that. I don't make takfir like this. You claim it's true. Maybe it's not true. And many times I've found that what she went to check, and she wasn't true in the first place at all. Not true at all. So, at-tawakkuf is 
to put be on hold, to put something on hold. And that could be different types as well. You could have different types of tawakkuf. Obviously, I'm not going to detail any of these. I'm just introducing all these terms for you, just to give you a glossary. So when I use them next week, inshallah, inshallah, you should recognize the terms easily. So tawakkuf, it could be the tawakkuf of the Mu'tazila, which is complete bid'ah. What they used to say is, he's neither Muslim nor kafir. He's menzil bayna menzilatayn. He's in a special place between the two places. This is a complete bid'ah, misguidance. You know, this one is rejected. This type of tawakkuf is misguidance, dalala. It could be a tawakkuf of tayassur or tasayyur or tayassur. To say, I'm taking it easy. Okay. Uh, the tawakkuf of holding back. For example, he believes he's kafir, but he doesn't want to say it. Okay. He believes he's kafir, but he doesn't want to say it. So that could be, for example, face to face with the person. You believe, oh my God, this person's kafir I'm talking to. But you want to give him da'wah. Because you want to give him da'wah, so you don't, you know, you don't start to, you know, uh, beat him heavily with a stick and say, you kafir, you mushrik, come listen to me. So, you, you believe in your heart, you believe first this person kafir, he left to follow Islam. He says some stuff, take him out of Islam. But let, him, let me guide him back to Islam. So I treat him gently. I don't need to mention the word, yeah, you're apostate. Nor do I need to give him salam or pray behind him either. But I don't necessarily need to spell it out to him. You know, immediately. I can say, look, come on. This is what the ulama said before. That's what you really believe, isn't it? Come on, you know, this is what we should believe in. This is what the ulama said. You think that we can be better? And then, alhamdulillah, when he comes out of that, you know, sometimes you can, you can help people, you see. This way, you can help people. When somebody says something wrong, Somebody says, Akhi, we have to obey the law of the land. Yeah? Two ways you can deal with him. You can say to him, you're a mushrik. And that's not going to get you anywhere. All he's going to do is, oh, he's takfiri. He's never going to listen to you again. Or you can say to him, Akhi, what you mean? What you mean is, we obey the law of Allah. And if there's something which the kuffar say in this country, in their laws, which is permissible in Islam, does not disagree with Islam, then it's allowed for us to stop at the red light, for example, because Allah said it's permissible. Yeah? yeah, And it's not a sin That's what you mean isn't it You mean what the ulama said That the customs of the people is permissible As long as it doesn't contradict Islam That's what you mean So you say yeah yeah that's what I mean. I mean So you save him from the kufr Isn't that better Instead of you immediately start to call him Kafir 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 And if you have this habit of just always using the word Making takfir like this all the time It's wrong Okay uh, you, know, you won't be able to give da'wah you won't be able to give them nasiha. It's better to be gentle with the person and you can find that they will actually come out of what they're saying and respond to you much better. So that's another type of tawakkuf. But another type of tawakkuf of tayassur, of this, of uh, uh, holding it, of, you know, of holding back, taking it easy, is out of fear. Out of, you know, I'm afraid what will happen to me if I don't call them Muslim or if I call them kuffar. You know, this Tahut regime is an apostate regime. If I call them apostates, they will, you know, they will deal with me harshly. They will put me in prison. They will arrest me. They will throw me out. They will kill me. Okay, for example. Some people, they will never face any of that. They will face a lot less than that. But that, they're still afraid. Some people, they, they think, look, right now I have a government job, government salary, company car, company house. They have that. You know, the, some of the ulama in Saudi Arabia, they get treated by the government very, very well. They have all of this. Big, expensive car paid for by the government. Big house paid for by the government. Big salary, prizes, you know, his name, people, they promote it everywhere. People say, look, refer to this sheikh, this is a good sheikh. We promote him, he is a good man. Then one day he says, but to rule by man, my lord, is kufr akbar, will take a person out of the fold of Islam. And, they, and in fact, what this regime is doing is not Islamic. Next day, he's got no house, he's got no car, he's got no salary. People say, the name's in the dirt, he said, don't listen to him anymore, he's an evil man, khawaj. Yeah? What did they do? And they're talking about this real case like this. He lost everything. So he came back. He said, oh, no, no, no. I, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. It's okay. Of course, it's Darul Islam. Of course, it's Sheikh Islam. Of course, he's, you know, Amir al-Mu'mineen. Okay? And that will happen. Somebody who does that is very serious. Okay? So there's, obviously, when he does that, he's no longer to Qutwaqub. Now he's made a decision. He's made to declare something that he's Muslim. But some people, they believe it's kafir, but they don't say it openly out of fear. That fear could be justified like somebody in prison under duress. Or it could be somebody who's not under duress and he's just a coward. Because it was his duty to come out 
And the ulama, the first one should be confronting the Tawheed and calling the people, desert, ishtarib al Tawhut, keep distance from this Tawhut. But when he doesn't do that, he does not fulfill the role of the ulama. So you can make that tawaqqaf and that is wrong. Okay, that out of the cowardice and that and the, the fear. Or it could be tawaqqaf of a tatabbut, tawaqqaf of verification. Is not to say, you know, I'm making an excuse for him, but say, hang on, before I jump to conclusions and make takfir of hawa, make takfir without verifying, maybe he was innocent all along. Before I do that, let me check, let me verify, let me investigate. That person not dispraised, you know, as long as he doesn't take the mick, doesn't take it too far, you know, his whole life investigating. Uh, you know, although having said that, I would say I do I do this a lot as well. In many cases, I just don't investigate it because you're not obliged to check every single person. You're not obliged to check, you know, to go door to door verifying every single person. Okay, tell me what you've done. Tell me what excuse. You don't need to do that. Okay. So some people ask you, why didn't you make the fear on so and so? I didn't look into it. So why didn't you look into it? Because it's not fault upon me. I don't need to. I don't have to look into every single person and look for a reason to call them kafir. You know, maybe I'll find one, maybe I won't. But I don't need to look into that person. It's not important. Sometimes we do it because there's a specific need for that. Zindiq. The word zindiq, I'm just going down the list here. We've passed our time, I think. But let me just quickly go through the last. The last ones are very important ones, but I'll go into more detail next week, inshallah. But I'll quickly just give you the definition, inshallah. The word zindiq, it means apostate. It's a term originally from the Persian but was used in the time of the Salaf as well uh, to refer to an apostate in general it means an apostate but more specifically people that use it to refer to an apostate that justifies his kufr with Islamic symbols okay, or rules or verses so, for example, like the one who says, Brother, you have to ally with the kuffar against Muslims in their wars against Islam because Allah said, Awfu bin Uqud, fulfill your contracts. This is Zandaka. You know, this is Zandaka. And this fatawa like this. There are some crazy people who are given this fatawa. This fatwa. So, look, if a Muslim joins the British Army or the American Army and they tell him to bomb the Taliban in Afghanistan, he said, He must do it. Because Allah said, fulfill your contracts. That is Zandaqa. The Kufr Akbar is justifying it, claiming that it's an Islamic thing to, to do. Okay? The Qadianis, if they try to claim that what they follow is Islam, their, their temples are masjid, that their book is the Quran, or from Allah, then that's called Zandaqa. If they call themselves like a Jew or a Christian, another religion, so like we just, you know, they're just like a form of Hindu. Okay, fair enough, you're just like a Hindu. Don't claim you're Muslim. Because when you decide to justify your Kufr as Islam, you can become Zindiq. Al Adir, and this is the really important points here, these ones. And this is what we are always really talking about. Al Adir refers to, and this is a very new term, and I want to stress this. It's a very new term. Okay? This term was not used before. It was not used before. The concept exists before. And if you stick to the original concept, you'll find nobody disagrees. Because on this issue, people, they start to call Dawla Kafir. They start to call the many ulama Kafir, Mujahideen Kafir, claiming that they are Adir. And they mean by this, the one who excuses Mushrikeen By ignorance. Okay? The word Adir just means the one who gives excuse, the one who excuses something or somebody. That's what it means. But they're referring specifically to somebody who makes excuse for the mushrikeen by ignorance, by jahl, by al udr bil jahl. Al udr bil jahl is the next one here. Okay? Al udr bil jahl means the excuse of ignorance. Okay, some of these times you should memorize them, remember them, because they are used a lot in sort of discussions and debates and conversations about takfir among the ulama, among the du'at, among the mujahideen nowadays. And you won't be able to follow the conversation unless you understand these words properly. So al-udr bil-jahal is called the excuse of ignorance. 
As we said, sometimes it's an excuse, sometimes it's not an excuse. We've already accepted and understood that the shirk is never excused. The shirk akbar from al masail jaliya. The great major shirk from the clear cut matters. And when I use the term like this, I, use, I try and be as accurate as possible. That's why if you notice people will ask me, so Yusuf Akhi, is there excuse of ignorance in shirk? I will reply, there is no excuse of ignorance in shirk akbar from al masail al jaliya. There is no excuse of ignorance in the major shirk, in the clear-cut matters. I want to be absolutely clear and accurate. I don't want to leave any room for there to be something, you know, which could be included in my speech, which is not accurate, which is not part of it. So we want to be jami' mani' Comprehensive and restrictive. Includes everything I mean and excludes everything that I don't mean. If I just say there's no excuse for ignorance in shirk, Okay, there are many types of shirk which there is excuse of ignorance. Shirk asghar matters for, for you know, such as atasha'um, tawatira. You know, we, we have some, of these, some people have these superstitions. You know, about they see a bad omen of the bird fly this way. This type of thing is not the same. You understand? It's not the same thing. You know, somebody uh, um, you know, had uh, a horseshoe on their, on their door. Okay, it's not the same thing. We need to understand there's a difference between well, shirk akbar from the clear cut matters and some of the, the lesser shirk or the shirk which is not clear, which is from Masail Khafiya, the hidden matters. Okay, so there's no excuse. And I believe everybody is agreed about that point as well. Nobody is either really in this sense. Not the Mujahideen, not Al Qaeda, not Dawla, not even many of the uh, government preachers. They have. The principle, they do, they believe if you ask them in different terms, this is why I say the terms will confuse everybody. Just ask the same question without these terms, become emotive terms because it becomes the issue now. Those who say, Adir, they're the Khawarij, and they're not necessarily the Khawarij, but it's become the issue. So, somebody when he hears that term, says, oh, okay, no, no, okay, I'm not with them because he just wants to be distant from them, not because they don't believe that the mushrik is kafir. Without, you know, even if they're ignorant, no. But because it's become partisan issue, become an emotive issue between the different people, and different groups. So if you ask the people, for example, is a Hindu kafir even though the message of Islam never reached him? They'll say, yes, of course he's kafir. You don't give an excuse to ignorance to him, do you? Meanwhile, even no message at all. They never even heard about Islam, never even heard about Muhammad. Is he still kafir? They say, yeah, he's kafir. Who, will, who won't agree with that? Everybody will agree with that. If you ask somebody, if somebody you know, was committed the shirk, Akbar worshipping the idols, you know, and he thought that that was okay because he didn't know, is he mushrik? Of course he's mushrik. Of course he's kafir. Nobody would disagree with that. But when you start to use the word Udr bil jahl, Adir, then you confuse people. Why? Because in their mind, Udr bil jahl means something else from what you're thinking. Their mind goes somewhere which your mind doesn't go. When they, when they use the word, uh, when you use the word jahl or jahlul hal, they mean something else. So jahlul hal, what is jahlul hal? Very quickly, inshallah. I know we brothers, we are late. I hope you, nobody needs to go anywhere. You're okay, yeah? Okay. So jahlul hal is ignorance about the reality. Okay. So for example, when we talk about voting, how do we, what do we say about the voting? You know, we say voting in democratic elections, parliamentary elections, is shirk akbar because it is choosing a legislator instead of Allah. Okay? And I like to take it even further, again, to be as accurate as possible. If somebody asks, asks you, is there an excuse of ignorance for that? I say there is no excuse of ignorance for the one who chooses a legislator instead of Allah. So clear. Who would disagree with that? Nobody would disagree with that. Even those who vote, they don't disagree with that. Do you understand? Because that's clear matter. And of course, there's no ignorance about that. Nobody will claim man should be legislated instead of Allah, except for a real kafir or mushrik, no doubt about him. But do people necessarily think that putting an X, that look, do people think that you got a ballot paper? Okay. That's what you got here. You put your little X here. Do people really think that, that putting that little X is choosing a legislator? You know, sometimes they think, no, no, he's not legislated. This is just mayor. The mayor doesn't do anything. 
Or say, no, this is just like a school board or something. Some people will be convinced, say, brother, if you just put this X here, then you'll get a mosque, you'll get benefits, you'll get welfare, you'll get this, you'll get that. You know? Other people, you go to other countries, Bangladesh, they'll come along to the village and say, I'll give you 10,000 dakha, just put an X here next to my name. They don't know what it is, they don't care what it is. It's 10,000 dakha. You know, one day's work, easy. You know, you understand? So for some people, they've never looked into what it is. We're the ones looking into what it is. We're the ones who investigate further and we look detail exactly what this voting business is, what these elections are about. You know, when you speak to the ordinary person and you say to them, can you choose a legislation of Allah? I say, no, astaghfirullah, never do that. And when you tell them that's what these elections are, they don't believe you. They say, no, no, it can't be true. No, there's no way that the Imam would tell us to do that. If you understand, because in their minds, that's not the case. That Imam is, is, is somebody, he needs to question his Imam. Because usually they know what they're talking about. But the ordinary people are not all the same. So, and you'll find those same people who talk about Al-Adir, make takfir upon the Adir, they say that if you don't make, if you know, give, make, you make takfir upon all the people who um, uh, give excuse ignorance to the mushrikeen. If you ask them about Jahlul Hal, and about the one who made, committed an act of kufr without realizing what, what the action was, it's like a slip. You know, he thought he was doing one thing, and actually he was doing something else. He had no clue that there was anything involved in legislation. They will agree with you that he's, he's excused. And people don't know that. They believe in that as well, just as we do. You understand? They believe in it just as you do. But because they call it Jahlul Hal, and they distinguish between this and Al Udub Al Jahl, so the whole time they will say, there's no excuse of ignorance in shirk. There's no excuse of ignorance in shirk. Then you ask them about Jahlul Hal, they say, yeah, yeah, of course that's an excuse. So is that part of. Jahl or not. Other scholars, they don't, they don't use this term. I don't use this term. I don't use that term. I mention it here because they use that term. Okay, that's their classification. They divided the Jahl into two types. And they say this one has no excuse. And they want everybody to say there's no excuse to ignorance. No excuse to ignorance. Other people, they include that as a form of Jahl. It is. Look, the Jahl is even the words even in the, in the name. It's even called Jahlul Hal. It's, a part, it's called Jahl. So other people, other scholars will say, Akhi, that's ignorance. It's excuse of ignorance. And they mean by that excuse ignorance of the reality, not of the hukum, not of the ruling. So they mean the same thing, but they're saying two, two different words and terminology. And that's what uh, will confuse people. Uh, just, these ones we don't need to go into too much detail now, inshallah. Adab al Qasid means uh, basically uh, like a slip, okay? Well, without targeting something. For example, Okay, for example, okay, li literally is qasd is when you target something. Like if you're if you're shooting uh, an arrow or shooting a gun at a target, you're aiming for the center. When it hits the outside ring, you didn't mean to hit the outside ring. You meant to meant to meet, hit the center. You know? So when it hit the outside, that's called adab al qasd. Yeah, or even worse, you aim for the center of the target and you hit your brother. You didn't mean to. You understand? It's not intentional murder. Because you didn't mean to do that. You meant to hit the target and the bullet went that way. Your arm slipped, your, your, you know, your body slipped, whatever it was, you slipped. You meant to say one word, another word came out, slip of the tongue. That's called Adam al Qasid. And this is an excuse in the Sharia. Okay? Irtifa al Qasid is the same thing. Okay? But then you say basically, you know, uh, the Qasid was, was lifted, wasn't there. So it's exactly the same thing, just another term used for the same thing. I've heard Abu Muhammad Maqdisi use this term, that's why I mentioned it here. Okay, whereas I use the word Adam al Qasd. Okay, Tasleel means chain. Okay, so chain, we're talking about here chain takfir. Okay, chain takfir. So when you say, you know, okay, I believe he did some kufr. If you don't call him kafir, then you're kafir. And if you don't call him kafir, then you're kafir. And if you don't call him kafir, then you're kafir. And if you don't call him kafir, then he's kafir. If I don't call you kafir, then I'm kafir. This is called chain takfir. <laughs> okay? This is called chain takfir. So sometimes we have chain takfir, sometimes we don't. Chain takfir in takfir al nas, where Allah declares somebody by name kafir. Fir'aun is kafir. If you don't think Fir'aun is kafir, you've denied the Quran, you become kafir. Okay? But some people, Allah did not name. But he just described the kufr. So it's your ishtihad that this person fell into that kufr and he has no excuse. 
Somebody else may differ with your ijtihad and say, no, I think he has an excuse. I think he was innocent. I think he was under duress. I think he was insane. I think he was you know, uh, not accountable. I think he's repented. That's why I don't call him kafir. He did it before, then he came back. Some people can have different interpretation of the reality because there's no text about that person. You can't say, maybe Fir'aun was under duress. You think Allah doesn't know if, Allah, if Fir'aun was under duress or not? You think Allah wouldn't know, doesn't know if he was insane or not? When Allah called him kafir, you think he didn't know? So obviously Allah knows. You know, if you think Abu Lahab is not kafir, he has some kind of excuse. How can he have an excuse and Allah you know, didn't tell us about the excuse and he called him kafir and he had a fire? Allah is not going to make a mistake. So there's no way that somebody named in the Quran Sunnah, you know, or people in general, you can't say, oh, the Jews and Christians are not kafir. Akhi. What do you mean? Allah called them kafir in the Quran. You can't say they're not kafir. Otherwise you become kafir. That's where you have the chain. Okay? Or even an apostate. Some people ask, is it only about kafir asli or is it about murtadin as well? No, it's about both. It's about both. Because it could be some people, Allah named them as an apostate. They used to be Muslim, like Ibn Ba'ura. Allah mentioned him in the Quran, Allah gave him knowledge. Then he betrayed it and Allah took it away from him. He being an apostate. No? Even Iblis, he used to be among the angels. Then he, what? he left Islam, he left the, the Tawheed. He turned away and then he became kafir. Musaylim al Kazab, Aswad al Ansi, they've been mentioned specifically as kufar, as apostates. So you can call them, so they will have chain takfir. You will have chain takfir about those people. Okay, so anything that's been mentioned, you will have chain takfir. Anybody not been mentioned is your ishtihad that he falls into that category uh, or not. And so then there could be difference of opinion. And we'll look into more of that inshallah next week because we'll talk about more about the different opinions where people have differed about takfir on certain individuals in the past as well as in the present inshallah. Inshallah, I hope this is beneficial for us to at least have a start uh, on this topic and to really deeply understand where these differences have occurred inshallah between the people.